Okay. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I, can you hear me okay? I'm Steve Levitsky. I'm director of the uh, David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies here at Harvard, and welcome to the now, I couldn't figure out how to pronounce it. Is it just the Mexico and water challenges, reckoning, and opportunities? Or is it Mexico plus HTO equals challenges, reckonings, and I couldn't figure it out. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know a few of you had some uh, travel adventures on the way. We are, uh, we are really appreciative of the time and the effort that you expended to make it here and join us. Um, Many thanks to the Dr. Class staff, uh, particularly Paola Ibarra, for making this great event happen. Thanks as well to our partners in this endeavor, the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the Department of History of Science. Before I introduce our two um, conference, star conference organizers, just I want to take a second to tell you how thrilled I am to, um, that we're doing this conference here at Harvard. Uh, you do not have to be a Mexicanist. I'm not a Mexicanist. You don't have to be a Mexicanist to realize just how tremendously important Mexico is uh, to the rest of the world and the rest of this uh, of, of North America. Here in the United States, the importance of, of studying and understanding Mexico just continues to grow, not only because of the vast economic ties between the two countries, not only because of the vast uh, and complex migration ties between the two countries, not only because of the devastation caused uh, by the drug trade and drug-related violence, but increasingly because of climate change, because of food insecurity, and of course, because of water. Um, Mexico has to have a central place, a, a primary place in the study of Latin America here in the United States. And in the coming years, um, we are hoping 
here at Dr. Class to elevate the standing of Mexican studies. That's a top priority. Um, in that context, it really thrills me to be able to host an event as important as this. Uh, so thanks for having me. Let me introduce uh, our two faculty chairs of the, of the Mexican program here at Dr. Class uh, and, uh, and the two co-organizers of this extraordinary conference. First, Diane Davis to my left is Charles Dyer Norton, Professor of Regional Development and Urbanism and also Chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. She's founder and curator of the Mexican Cities Initiative uh, at the GSD. Her research um, interests are known to, to all of you. They include the relations between urbanization and national development, comparative urban governance, urban violence, and the new territorial manifestations of sovereignty. She's written half a dozen books on these uh, topics, including Urban Leviathan, a classic book on modern Mexico City, uh, and the award-winning Discipline and Development, Middle Classes and Prosperity in East Asia and Latin America. It's good to see you, Diane. Uh, Gabriela Soto Laviaga is professor, uh, is first of all, Antonio Madero, professor for the study of Mexico here at Harvard and professor of the history of science. Her research interests include uh, knowledge production and circulation between Mexico and India, medical professionals and social movements, and science and development projects in the 20th century broadly. Professor Soto Laviaga's first book, Jungle Laboratories, um, Mexican Peasants, National Projects, and the Making of the Pill won the Robert K. Merton Best Book Prize in Science, Knowledge, and Technology Studies from the American Sociological uh, Association. Her second book, Sanitizing Rebellion, uh, Physician Strikes, Public Health, and Repression in 20th Century Mexico, looks at the role of healthcare providers as both critical actors in modern state formation and as social agitators. Her most recent book, how do you have the time? Her third book, good. God, uh, re-narrates histories of 20th century agricultural development from the point of view of India and Mexico. I guess that is on its way, right? Um, Professor Soto Laviaga has held numerous fellowships, including those from Ford, Mellon, Fulbright, Goethe Henkel Foundations, as well as the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Gabriela, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Steve, for um, those very generous introductions. It's, uh, it's great to have a jefe Maximo like uh, Steve guiding us. Um, and uh, I want to welcome everyone. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos a nuestra conferencia sobre agua. Uh, el agua en sus pasados, sus presentes y los futuros sobre agua. Welcome, all of you, to this conference about Mexico's futures, Mexico's present, and the pasts of water. We're hoping to have a day and a half of really engaged conversations. But I want to start with just a minute to, to remind us that yesterday was Wor World Water Day and the start of the 2023 United Nations Water Conference. It is no coincidence that we decided to organize our water conference here on Mexico on, in, during this week. The conference at the UN is billed as a, quote, a once in a generation opportunity to unite the world around solving the water and sanitation crisis. And it hopes to draw attention to the current and coming water crisis that we will all face. Here in the United States, for example, just this week, on Monday, the Navajo Nation has taken water rights questions to the Supreme Court. At stake is more than a decades long drought but rather the issue of who has legal rights, ownership to water. Access to water also means who has rights to the nation's rivers. So we're talking about not only how we divide land, but how we divide water. Which historical treaties and agreements will stand a legal challenge? And most important, which entities, states, or in this case, sovereign Native American nations, private or collective interest will prevail in the future con contestation over water. Entangled with access to water are land and water issues that have not yet been resolved, but that trace their roots to colonialism and imperialism. To speak about water is also to speak about infrastructure, as our distinguished panel here will tell us, who has access to it and who does not. As we battle with drought in the Southwest, 
and with an unusually wet winter in California that has ruined already so many crops, which is so significant because California is the breadbasket of the United States. What will that mean for the future? So why focus on Mexico? Why now? Just as we learned during the pandemic that viruses and microbes do not respect national borders, water does not either. When allowed to take its natural course, it does not abide by human-made barriers. It always finds a natural course. To find water solutions, we cannot think only within our borders. We need to think cooperatively, binationally. Only then can we find lasting solutions to our most pressing problems. In this case, access to water for all. So to echo what Steve was saying, here at Harvard, we really are putting Mexico as front and center uh, a space that we not only need to dialogue with, but co collaborate with, and most importantly, think beyond the scholarship, think beyond our campus and beyond our nation. So with that, I turn to my esteemed colleague, Diane Davis, who will introduce the next panel. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, I'm thrilled to be here at this conference, which has already been in the making for eight months. And I want to join my co-chair, Gabriella. Beautiful remarks, Gabriella. I would have thought the same things, but you said them so articulately. Uh, as well as thanks, Steve, for introducing everybody, welcome, wel welcoming you all to this event that we're very excited about here at Harvard. And again, the World Water Day a couple of days ago and the IPCC report that came out just a few days ago, as well as the UN Water Conference. Um, so I think we're set to embark on a day and a half, not only of discussion, but also provocation and perhaps even disagreement about the question of water in Mexico. Um, part of the history, culture, economy, well, so many important parts of its history, culture, economy, urbanization, rural development, and binational relations, to repeat some of the themes that Gabriela has mentioned, have involved water in some way or another. And they have brought conflicts, but maybe they brought conflict cooperation in different historical moments. And we are yet at another moment, again, with climate change making intense the problems of who has access to water, what does it mean when you don't have water, what happens when you have too much water or not enough water. The fluidity of the problems that come with the fluidity of water are a real challenge to all of us scholars and, and, and social and natural scientists represented here in the panels today. I could not be happier than having the opportunity to be involved in pulling together the lineup for this conference with Gabriela. She has many good friends. I have some good friends. We're getting to know each other. I knew people that maybe neither of us know are also here. So, I mean, it's just a, uh, it's a joy to be, have an opportunity to talk among ourselves with everybody having a different way of thinking about water it, on the basis of their own work or their own practice. So my job tonight is to moderate this panel. And I'll just start by saying we have an embarrassment of riches in the panel, a keynote panel with three very important scholars tonight. Maybe we shouldn't have piled you all on the same panel, but there, there's a logic for that. And of course, we have so many great speakers coming during the day tomorrow. Um, but we chose these three scholars because they approach the topic of water from very different vantage points, from anthropological history, politics, and landscape urbanism. These scholars all have something important to say for those of us who are interested in the relationships or the dialogues between social science and humanities approaches, or well, social science, science and humanities approaches to water. And as well as it has something to tell us well, the panel will have something to say to those of us, and I put myself in this category, who are interested in action, design, and engineering approaches to water. So not just analyzing the problematic of water, but figuring out can and should we be doing something about it in order to preserve cultures, livelihoods, prosperity, the planet in general. Um, the speakers that we have asked to speak on this panel 
um, purposefully transcend these disciplinary divides. So not only will they say a little something, I don't want to pigeonhole one as an anthropological historian, one as a landscape designer, because in a way I know that they already implicitly have conversations across disciplines. And one thing that we'll try to do after we hear from our speakers is engage if we have time, and I, that's why we're hoping we'll have time. So maybe dialogue among you all. Um, I also want to say that those particular vantage points or entry points, that cross disciplinarity, the kind of analytics and action will also be replicated in all the panels tomorrow it, with the different constellations, um, which, and if you've seen the program, we will be looking at urbanization, we will be looking at law and ownership and border conditions, all things that can be studied across with different disciplinary vantage points. So again, it's our hope that we can start that interdisciplinary productive conversation with the panel today. So I have asked our speakers to try to give us a kind of an overview of their work or what they want us to think about in 15, max 20 minutes. I think I said 15 just so we have time. And we will start, I'm going to introduce the three speakers and then we'll turn it over to them one at a time, but I want to introduce them all. To, to get us started, we will begin with Iñaki Echevarria, who will be talking, generally speaking, although we didn't print titles in the program, on soft infrastructure, a gardener's logic. Um, and Iñaki is an architect, landscape urbanist, and entrepreneur based in Mexico City. He specialized in the integration of techniques com conventionally associated with architecture, science, technology, and ecology. To consider the intersection as an opportunity to transform buildings, landscapes, and infrastructure. He's been for a while now studying the region around Lago de Texcoco, actually for 18 years, I think, your bio says. And today he's the director of the Parque Ecologico Lago de Texcoco, a very um, known and maybe con controversial project in Mexico City. And don't get me started on the politics of the airport which I've written about in the closing, but not only will he share with us his beautiful design visions and a lot of his epistemologies, but also we'll maybe be able to talk about the politics of it later when we turn it over to Veronica Herrera, who will speak second after, uh, after Iñaki, generally on the politics of water provision in Mexico City, in Mexican cities. Veronica is an associate professor of urban planning and political science at UCLA, and I might add a former visiting scholar at Dr. Class, uh, who when you were here kindly came to one of my classes focused on water and urbanization in Hermosillo several years back, and that's where I met Gabriela. You had just come to Harvard too. We were looking more at drought than water in the case of the Sonoran Desert. But, um, so Veronica studies the politics of development in global south cities with a special focus on Latin America. And her research interests include urban politics, decentralization, civil society participation, social mobilization, and environmental politics and policy making. And she is also an expert on water policy in international development, as well as author of several important books on this topic, which include, and I've used it in my classes, Water and Politics, Clientelism and Reform in Urban Mexico. Um, that came out in 2017, and she has a forthcoming book called Slow Harms in Citizen Action, Environmental Degradation and Policy Change in Latin American Cities. Oxford is putting that out, I guess, this coming year. And then we will turn to Lisa Lucero, who's speaking about ancient Maya self-cleaning reservoirs and the insights of that knowledge for today. Uh, Lisa is a professor of anthropology at the University of Illinois Urban Urbana-Champaign and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's an archaeologist and her interests focus on ritual and power, water management, the impact of climate change on society, and sustainability in tropical regions, and as well as the ancestral Maya. Uh, she got her PhD, there's a little thread here, from UCLA, I got my PhD at UCLA, you're teaching at UCLA, um, in 94 and has been conducting archaeology in Belize for over 30 years. Um, and so she'll talk a little more about Maya knowledge, which might then allow us to loop back to the kind of work that we're going to see from Iñaki about water, um, water 
functions and the, the relationship to history, culture, and ritual. So after we hear from each of the speakers, I will propose a few follow-up questions if it seems appropriate to create a dialogue and then we'll open it out to the audience for questions. And I just wanna mention that we've got this front row here that we're all gonna sit here because as Inyaki underscored, we all wanna see what everybody else is presenting so we don't wanna be sitting up here on the panel. So without further ado, I wanna turn the podium over to Inyaki. showed me how to do this. Great. Mac persons always suffer with PCs. And um, well, I want to take one of my 15 minutes to thank you for the invitation to be here. It's great to be here to talk about water. I think it's one of the most important issues that we can talk about in any case in the world. Uh, so Diane, Gabriela, you know, and the, the, the Please, everyone involved, thank you so much for the, for the invitation and for the opportunity to participate in such an important symposium. Um, as Diane mentioned, I'm going to jump directly because I have a lot of stuff that I want to show. And, you know, if it's too long, I, I will just stop and that's it. Um, I call this uh, soft infrastructure, a gardener's logic. Uh, this title refers to an idea that I first introduced about, it was already 22, I have to fix that in the resume, 22 years ago or 23 years ago in an article I wrote, I co-wrote with Richard Pluns uh, from the Earth Institute, uh, we call the gardener's logic. And in that, uh, and soft infrastructure referred uh, to the idea that we had to evolve, that infrastructure had to evolve and that cities had to evolve in order to be, to be able to confront the challenges that li were lying before us. This was, as I said, ideas that I had been thinking about already 25 years ago, and these are going to be a series of slides that are a little bit old, but uh, first it came from the, I was studying cities, well, uh, I was mainly studying cities, and basically out of 30 cities that would, you know, would have a population that uh, more than 10 million around 2030, only five would be in the, in the first world, or the so-called first world. So in many ways, the city had stopped to or had ceased to become uh, a Western phenomenon. Uh, that was actually acknowledged uh, uh, very you know, clearly by Rem Kulhas, who said it uh, when he was studying Lagos in Nigeria. He realized that uh, everything he, he he worked on was not being, was not sufficient to uh, to confront the, the challenges he was uh, uh, learning about in, in in Lagos. So, but this let, let me just give a few examples. One is has to do with food. You know, by by 2050, we're going to be about 10 million billion people in the world, which by today means, uh, or our means of production, it means that we have to increase the yield of production by 70%. But if we are to believe Molly Jan, who was an advisor to President Obama in food security, there's a lot of inefficiencies. There's like 1.3 billion tons, and that was this was about eight years ago, probably. 1.3 billion tons of food that is wasted each year, then there's a lot of food that is actually lost, not wasted, but lost because of poor infrastructure in poor countries, which is a different thing, transport, uh, cooling, etc., water, you know, irrigation in dry seasons. And uh, only 0.3% of all the sweet water of our planet is available, available for human access. And I would add in other populations, not only human. 70% of this water is devoted to agriculture. So, you know, the amount of energy we, we have to consider desalination is it's really limited as an alternative. And when I learned that, and I actually learned not far from here in MIT in a series of conferences in, called MTEC uh, years back, I, re I started to go, into, to go deep into it. And it, I realized it takes about one hectare or 2.5 acres of jungle to grow a head of cattle in southeast Mexico. It takes about, uh, or maybe two, you know, two heads of cattle. But it takes a lot, one hectare definitely in dry areas like uh, the north of Mexico. And even if you feed them with, you know, like they do in the states in a more efficient way, you need 25, uh, 25 tons 
of grain, which takes about 90,000 square meters or nine hectares to grow, to, to, to produce uh, one ton of beef cattle, which makes it just incredibly unsustainable. That would mean that the current land use back then would have to grow to something like this by 2050. And that also means water. Yeah? Second example is this, and it's something that I also thought, thought about for a long, long time. I mean, nature gave us this incredible pump that basically what it does is whatever we eat, it just basically dries it. Yeah? And then we had this incredible idea to go and throw it back into water. And so this means that we not, we're not only you know, really working against the, the, the grain, but also we're polluting our planet in incredible ways and creating just some terrible situations around the world, uh, which go all the way to affect not only human population, but even other populations, because not only <coughs> sewers and waste produce nitrogen, but also all of the pesticides, uh, fertil fertilizants that we use, are, or most of them are based in nitrogen, which uh, creates eutrogenation in the, uh, I, somebody help me there, please. Uh, eutrogenation, uh, eutrophication, thank you, sorry. My English is rusty. Uh, so we're, we're really killing our oceans and, uh, and water bodies. And third, as an example, it's, it's something that I've you know, started to think about a, a long time ago, and then I found this picture which sort of grabs it, and is that nature in all its iterations never came up with an animal with wheels. And even though we, it never happened, we still think that this is something that, has, that is a super great idea for mobility, especially for mass mobility, because maybe bikes are a different story. But we built just paved roads. This is not even a historical number. Uh, which is, I don't know, if you throw this subsidized into any idea, I think you can make it work. You know, it would seem like a good idea. And not only that, but it's uh, these streets and the, the streetscape that we created, it's monofunctional. Just like sewers, just like everything, we have created infrastructure that is basically just one thing. And also, it's allowed to become an exception in territory. It's, a, it's an exception to city making is an exception to place making and to inhabiting. So this takes us to what we're trying to do in Texcoco, or what we're working in Texcoco. First of all, we're, rich, we're trying to approach the project from a perspective of a multifunctional inhabitable space. This space, it's, and you will see further, uh, further down the presentation, needs to be infrastructure and needs to be uh, uh, security infrastructure. It also needs to be, become more. And I begin with this presentation, because it was with this slide, the presentation of the project, because in many ways, it's a project that has to do with beauty, deep inside. But it has to do with beauty in a much more profound sense that we use it. It's not epidermical, it's not superficial, but it's rather what ancient medics used to call a beauty, which is health. This is a project about environmental and social health. It's about human health and other populations. It's about making systems work in a better, more, in a much better way together. And I, this image was taken by one of my colleagues, I don't remember exactly who, but like 15 years ago from Lake Nabor Carrillo, when the, when the volcanoes were not, still had a lot of snow actually. It's kind of sad that in 15 years, even one of the glaciers, last glaciers in the South Sea, what was had melted, but uh, but it reminds me of that all the time. Anyway, and uh, then I'm going to show some images that were uh, gracefully uh, lent to me by Thomas Filsinger, who is this artist that has uh, uh, imaged what uh, Tenochtitlan and the ancient uh, lakes of Texcoco, which were five lakes that created this enormous interior. Uh, interior ocean looked like. Uh, the Valley of Mexico is a Cuenca, uh, an endorheic basin, which means basically that every, all the water that comes in stays there, doesn't connect to any rivers. So it's really like, a, like an ocean, but it, we, that, that fluctuates with the seasons, and we have basically two seasons, dry season and rain season. And when, when it rains a lot, these five lakes, which was, they were uh, Zumpango and Jaltocan, 
further left, uh, Texcoco, uh, Xochimilco, and Chalco connected through wetlands. And uh, when, when it got dry, sometimes they actually separated. Anyway, I'm going to switch the image. Imagine it's north. What you were looking at, you were looking from here to the east. And this is a, this, the, the way it looked more or less in 1330. And uh, this is where the Aztecs found the Tenochtitlan, which by 1510 looked something like this already. And it, uh, it was a system of production, a political system that, an inhabitation that allowed 1.2 million people to, to feed and to live in the area. Just to give you a sense of scale, the largest city in Europe at the time was about 300 or 400,000 people. So we've been a mega city for quite a while. And I think that we haven't taken advantage of that because we have a lot to, 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 to talk about in terms of, or teach in terms of how we inhabit that mega city or how not to do it because mistakes also are also a source of knowledge. By 1850, with the, after the, the conquista, it, the, you know, the Spanish city looked something like this. It was already completely desiccated uh, in the central area, but it existed farther east. And you could actually navigate still from Xochimilco, Chalco, and you could connect the city through canals and uh, through an incredible uh, capable system of infrastructure that, again, not only created the connection, it was something that was used for commerce, for, you know, for transport of goods, but it was also landscape. It was also uh, something that built territory and city. And just to show how this worked a little bit over time, you know, this may be a dramatization, but this is more or less where we are now. And uh, basically what's left is the possibility and the opportunity to recover part of, the, of this landscape. Some in Xochimilco you know, uh, to the south, and the, some in, in, in Texcoco, and particularly Texcoco as a, I would say the piece of resistance for uh, for a larger project, which will be, or would be, the um, like a, a, a vision that my, my uh, shared with my friends from uh, Atenco, which is a larger recovery of the basin, or at least the the, the micro basin of the C Valley, Mexico City Valley. For those of you, I guess everyone most most everyone knows the city, but for those who don't, this is just an image, and this is one of the nicest areas in the city. Uh, no, but to understand the size. Also, this created a condition which is uh, incredibly dangerous, potentially, and this is what also created a confusion, which is uh, floodings. And this is not theoretical. The dark, the, the light is the original lake, but the dark area is the area that could still flood if the pumping systems fail. And this is not theory. It used to happen every year. You know, This is downtown Mexico. You can see by the cars around 40s, 50s, but this is still now. And the, the drama of this is that it's also sewage. It's, it's not only rainwater. So this is actually something that is super dramatic. This created, from a long time, you can see the, the, the year of the map, a uh, history that, made, again, my friends of Atenco called hydrophobica, hydrophobic, which, is, which basically it turned um, every piece of engineering in the, in the area into a strategy to send water away from the valley and into Hidalgo, to keep this area as dry, as dry as possible, to be able to use it for, um, for, for flooding control. But that also creates another problem, which is a heat island. And this heat island also desiccated all the soil, and this created, uh, the soil is very thin, it's particles, uh, these are PM10. That basically means that when you breathe them, they go directly into your lungs. They create all sort of uh, uh, chronic uh, uh, respiratory diseases, and also they uh, eventually could create. Uh, could, uh, they could be related to cancer. And again, this is not theory. This is something that used to happen. You can see the Caballito, this is Reforma Avenue, and because of that, there has been a series of projects that uh, ha have been thinking about this area. You can see this from 1930. Where I'm not going to go into them because it's uh, each one of them, but I'm just going to show the, you know, 1936, 1947, 1951, you know, already the idea of a lake, you know, see the boat, you know, reforestation, et cetera, to, avo to, 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 to avoid these uh, dust storms. Uh, again, in, uh, 
uh, a little bit later, 1953, and some more, you know, 1969. And there was another one which is closer to us, but uh, which is Gerardo Krushank. Sorry, uh, I, I didn't. I don't know why the image got lost. But uh, this is just to say, this is not something that someone came up with, you know, two years ago. We've been thinking about this for a long, long time. And some people like Nabor Carrillo, who, who actually was the one to predicted the, the, the sinking of the city and the floodings as, as something more dramatic. And Gerardo Crucian, who operated this area as a reserve, were more, the more successful in the modern times in terms of uh, turning them turning into uh, an ecological endeavor. But, uh, but still, you know, I want to show this is a really big opportunity that we have. Uh, this is Manhattan, the Isle of Manhattan, superimposed on the site. So that gives you a sense of, uh, of scale. The site is about 23 times, uh, well, no, because of the new area in Chapultepec, it's about 18 times Chapultepec, the four sections. It's about 40, 41 times Central Park, just to give you an idea. This is Hyde Park in London. You know. Jose Caracol is 800 hectares. So that's basically all of Chapultepec fits here. And another Chapultepec fits in this 900 hectares down here. So the, the opportunity, just because of size, is enormous. But so are the challenges, you know, to talk about opportunities and challenges. But you know, things are amazing, because uh, this project was there for, long, for, for a few years. And then uh, yesterday, it's, um, it's uh, our first birthday from the presidential decree that created a natural protected area. So it's. Uh, it was a very happy day for me, you know, because I've been working on this for a long, long time. I, I couldn't believe it. And it's the first level of protection. But actually, there, are, there have been more. The, the wetlands that exist, like, for example, this one here in the north, the Cienega San Juan, and a few others, Laguna Jalapango, etc., were uh, declared Ramsar sites in, uh, already in Switzerland. And it's also declared as a site for, of importance for birds. So what are we trying to do? Well, the idea be, behind the project, like, like I said, is an, a health, a public health and social health project, an environmental health project. But what that means is that we will try to bring as much water as possible to regenerate as much as, as much as possible. Now that's an enormous challenge because most of the water that we could use is either lost in um, in agriculture that is very inefficient in. Uh, irregular urban use, and also in a lot of water that is sent to Valle del Mesquital in Hidalgo. And we cannot simply uh, you know, pull the plug on that, like some of my colleagues have suggested, because uh, these people have been receiving these waters for like 120 years. So it's, you cannot simply pull that plug. You, could, you would create a revolution immediately, and with all reason, I think. In the, so it has to be a larger conversation, a larger thing about technifying agriculture, probably looking for a, a produce that is not so thirsty, etc. A series of strategies that would allow to keep more water in here. Also, it's a conversation, and that is something that I have been trying to do for the past three years, with the engineers who are in charge of securing the, the metropolitan area in terms of floodings. Because they, there's big confusion normally with between danger and risk, not their use as synonymous, and the, because of these engineers uh, who operate this area and um, and who conceptualize this area, they keep it completely dry to avoid any danger. But the reality is that we don't have to avoid all dangers. We have to manage risk, just like the Dutch have taught us for a long, long time, and not risk people, but just you know, understand how far we can go because then maybe with a little bit of water we could avoid dust storms, we could create habitat for birds, we could create an amazing landscape and still you know, send water to Hidalgo. And, you know, if we actually harvest, for example, water during the rain season, then use it in certain areas during the, the, the dry season. So these are images that we used like three years ago to explain what we're, tr we're trying to do. And now what I'm going to show is just uh, very quickly some of the projects that we're working on. And we, we couldn't operate in the entire site, as you can imagine, because of mere just size you know, and time. But also because there were, there's a lot of material that was thrown here. It's a, that's a, 
completely different lecture, but le lecture, but it's uh, that this ne level of destruction that was uh, that took place in order to bring stone and materials to build here in the uh, in, in this area to build the airport, it's uncanny, and uh, the, a lot of this material is re being recycled. We used a lot of it. Well, not a lot. There's actually a little part to do a lot of things because it's so much material, but also uh, the, the, the Sedena, the, the military who are in charge of many construction projects in the, in, in the country, are using this material to take it to, on, to other places. So they are still working, for example, mainly in this area to the, let's say, the west of the, of, of the site. So we concentrated on, on the east and also a little bit on the south. Uh, we decided to go, even though I'm not a particular fan of uh, urban acupuncture as a you know, full strategy, I think it has to be a little bit more hybrid, but uh, we sort of went for a, a strategy about acupuncture. You know, even though they're big chunks, we tried to, do, to intervene certain areas that will detonate a, a connection between them and also certain dynamics that are different to the site. The first thing that we did, we, we built a nursery a nursery that will allow us to have plants that tolerate salt in the area. Not many, there's, I mean, there's actually, uh, Dr. Sombrano is, 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 was, uh, I think, helping at this Pedro Camarena who worked on this uh, for a long time with some, in some areas. There, there's this confusion that only two plants grow in this area. And the truth is that it's, we have a palette that uh, the landscape team created acknowledged through scientific, uh, serious scientific research or by just direct observation on the site of about 220. Out of those, we're working with, with like 70 and we're no, going into reforestation, built a building to make it a social and um, a space for people, education, research, etc. And then we're recovering water bodies. First, the first one is two minutes. Okay, so I'll, We'll stop at two minutes, that's okay. Uh, which is the Cienega de San Juan, which is this beautiful thing that was destroyed. This is just next to the city. And what we did is we created these ditches that uh, when it rains, allowed for more rain to be captured and uh, uh, slow the evaporation. And when it rained like you know, a lot in 21, we managed to see how it worked and created these beautiful landscapes where we also created stations for people to go and uh, for better bird observation, etc. Then the Nabor Carrillo, we're rebuilding the parts of it to be flooded again. We're working with the people from Atenco for to recover some rivers, and this, for example, would be an opportunity for you know for the future. This is Mesahualcoyo. This is all infrastructure from Conagua for water treatment, and. What you see here is already a park. It's just we just need to clean the water because it already looks like this, and this is next to the city. It's quite amazing, and we also this is the last thing building a really big uh, park, the first stage, which is a sports park, and this area is about 270 hectares, so it's like the second section of Chapultepec, and we'll have all sorts of you know, uh, even a building for visitors, you know, in wood, which is what we're working with because it's good for the area. It works in the area, not because we believe necessarily in the revolution of wood. And of course, we're working with the people. This is a biocultural pro reserve. This is the idea of the project. So all of this, La Hueva del Mosco, uh, La, La Tequesquite, all of these processes that exist since pre-Hispanic times are not only something that is considered for the future, but it's something that is actually still happening. And with that one, uh, no, I, I finish and I thank you for your attention. Sierra <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Diane and um, Gabriela. Um, it's wonderful to be here today with all of you. In my remarks, I'm going to discuss why and how Mexico's water and sanita sanitation sector is undermined by political challenges and what the role of civil society may be in helping to hold government accountable. Is it, do I need to be here or is this okay? Yes? Okay. Okay, so let me begin with a few questions. Number one, why is it that even though the Mexican national census says that Mexico's urban water coverage is 98%, as many as half of registered water users in many cities turn on their taps and receive no water due to poor water pressure or the, fam the el famoso tandeo uh, or the fixed schedules that most water utilities uh, use to service neighborhoods, meaning that most, most, uh, most people have intermittent water access. Okay, number two, why is it that many of the nation's 2,500 municipal water utilities serve large portions of registered customers who pay their bills and are you know, official customers of the utility uh, by pipa, or water tankers that bring um, water to fill up cisterns, often yellow water, murky water? And number three, why is it that 73% of the national population relies on bottled water as their primary source of drinking water, and that this has gone up from 61% in 2010, making Mexico the top, in the top three of the um, highest bottled water consumers in the world? My answer? Politics. Okay. It's because elected officials have direct oversight over water utilities and routinely use the sector as political spoils to exchange water for the vote. It's because elected officials at local, state, and federal levels prefer to invest in ribbon-cutting ceremonies rather than in repairing existing infrastructure that's leaky and filled with lead. And it's because in some areas, uh, industries such as Coca-Cola or beer companies are able to withdraw enormous amounts of water um, while adjacent communities suffer dire drought. Ojo, I could be talking about many different countries in Latin America or the Global South, just happen to be this conference is on water, I'm in Mexico, so uh, you know, we're focusing on Mexico, but um, this is a global phenomenon. Okay, how do we get here? What is the sort of political, uh, historical background? Um, so in the 20th century, non-democratic regimes around the globe routinely administered water service through a highly centralized system. This was a case uh, for Mexico from the early 20th century until the 1990s. So around the world and in Mexico, there was some version of ISI or import substitution industrialization, which typically governed the economy. And the state was the employer, the builder, and the constructor of everything, including infrastructure for water. Countries ne needed to be able to closely control their water supply for transitions away from rain fed to irrigated agriculture, and also to attend to the first waves of mass urbanization, which was occurring around this time uh, in all over the global south, but especially, you know, to speaking about Mexico. This required large infrastructure investments as part of um, a broader development strategy. And the political regimes that constructed and built these uh, massive pu public works projects tended to provide water for free or at high, highly subsidized rates. Um, in Mexico, of course, this was all occurring under the PRI, which, as everyone knows, uh, uh, was a political party that ruled the country for 70 years uninterrupted at all three levels of government. But it's an important fact for understanding Mexico's water, actually. Um, so part of how uh, the PRI was able to win elections repeatedly was, you know, massive fraud, but also uh, a lot of exchanges of things like cash, food, cheap housing, free water, uh, for political support. Much of this 20th century state-led development model was based on the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, from the US, which was you know, sort of exported all over the world, and in Mexico manifested itself in the Secretaría de Recursos Hidráulicos, uh, which ran all decision-making 
uh, about all urban water provision in a highly controlled way directly from Mexico City. Uh, if you talk to engineers around the country, they will say during that time, you know, you couldn't change a valve in, you know, this particular location far away without a phone call from Mexico City. It was, it was really very hi highly controlled. And then following the 1980s, all of this begins to change. Uh, much of the country begins an era of decentralization and market reforms. The neoliberal package, which, you know, so many of us are so familiar with, um, following the debt crisis, consisted of a large number of World Bank programs that was, were intended to modernize uh, the water sector and conditionality agreements from the IMF that helped further this impulse in Mexico's water sector. So um, several things were happening um, at once here, um, which is that policies that decentralize utilities uh, effectively uh, made it such that mayors and city councils were, became direct overseers of these water utilities um, through these water boards where mayors were able to appoint the water utility director and, um, and down the line. Um, this was enforcing a constitutional amendment that had been around for a long time but had never really been you know, in practice uh, a municipal responsibility. And then at the same time, federal programs are drying up uh, such that um, mayors are more on their own now. The federal transfers have kind of dried up, and so now you're on your own in res with respect to financing these systems. Um, and this is a beautiful mural. If you've never seen it, you know, check it out. And it just, it, Diego said everything you need to know about <laughs> 20th century uh, Mexican water, but... Um, Okay, so these dynamics, the, this is a, these, these sort of historical legacies, uh, along with uh, new things that came up, created really important political and institutional challenges that, that continue to um, undermine and hamper the ability to improve the water and sanitation sector in, in Mexican cities. Um, so I wanna kind of review what some of those are um, on this slide. So, um, Okay, so we've got market reforms, we've got decentralization, and then we have um, democratization happening at the same time, right? At the same exact time, Mexican cities are shifting to multi-party rule. You have mayors coming from the PAN, the PRD, that are winning office for the first time. This is before Fox takes office in 2000. You've got these, these new political parties, and they are really trying to govern the water sector at this point, right, um, in, in a very weak institutional environment, right? So what I mean by that is that you have um, enforcement of laws and stability of laws is, is, is really weak. And, you know, in this, in this sort of era where they have all these new responsibilities, they also then have these weak institutional, you know, um, environments and they have uh, more austerity, right? Because you have the political and administrative decentralization, but not fiscal decentralization. And you have market reform era where Conagua is being created for the first time in the early 90s. And all of this is cost recovery. Cities have to impose new tariffs and go into cost recovery in order to, um, you know, be able to finance operations and management. And this is the new policy making from the top, and this is what mayors are, are, are kind of charged with. Okay, so what's happening? Why is this so difficult to do? Very, very, um, uh, you know, big impact on the water and sanitation sector. Um, I wanna talk about the logic of, 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 of sort of mayoral control. Um, you have these three dynamics that are very, uh, I think, very important to understand in the water sector. Um, so partisan interference. You know, I have a few, a few, a few things here. One is clientelism. Political scientists talk about clientelism. Uh, Non-political scientists, actually, in Mexico talk about clientelism. I feel like a lot of Mexicans talk about clientelism just as an you know, everyday idea. Uh, but this is the exchange of cash, uh, food, water for the vote. Very, very prevalent in the water sector. Um, and another thing that's very prevalent in the water sector is patronage. And what I mean by that is that when you are a mayor, and you're running for office, you count on a lot of people to help you get elected into office, to go out there and knock on doors and get people out on the streets and get people out to vote. Those people expect to be paid back 
But the, way, the only way you have to pay them back, supposedly, or the way you pay them back is by giving them positions in municipal office. And so when you go to a water utility and you're wondering who is a director, who is the manager, who are all of the people underneath, they're all political appointments. And they're all people who are there that follow the electoral cycle. And every three years, new mayor comes in and all those people leave. So the only people that know what's going on are the people who are <laughs> unionized and at the bottom. And this is sort of the folks who are running water utilities. Of course, there's a lot of variation in, the, in, 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 in all that. But this is a, a general dynamic that, that kind of helps to explain uh, governance issues. OK, and then collusion with the private sector. So I, I mentioned this sort of collusion or this problem of industrial uh, access, uh, which, is, which is a big problem in Mexico and many other countries as well. Um, I do want to mention um, also, though, that, OK, so if you want to understand urban environmental policy problems, you have to understand the role of the re real estate. And how prevalent it is, and I'm not just talking about Mexican cities, but you have another project coming out on Lima, Buenos Aires, and, and Bogota. Very, very common that city council members are getting kickbacks from the real estate uh, developers to develop these projects unregulated with, 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 you know, on the wetlands, drying up the wetlands, or um, to create, um, you know, an area where you're getting access to water even though you shouldn't and you're not paying for it and all these things are happening that is really messing up water access for the utility. And they're not only receiving kickbacks, sometimes you dig around and you realize this city council member is actually the owner of that real estate company under, you know, a few different names. So a lot of that is, is really alarming the extent to how prevalent it is um, as a, um, a factor that undermines good governance um, for cities. And then a third category that I want to mention, um, my slides, I guess, got a little turned around uh, in the transition from the Mac to the, the PC here, is conflicts between tiers of government at the national, state, and local level. So um, you have different political parties, you know, at, the, at these different levels, you have different political factions, and there is a tremendous amount of hoarding of information or manipulation of data because even though you're, you're managing water sector and it's supposed to be this technical thing, supposedly, um, you're concerned if you're from this political party or that political party that um, that, that data is going to be used you know, to, to further an objective that doesn't fit into your political party's credit claiming. And so this really affects the water sector quite a bit, especially in um, states where there is a lot of variation between uh, political parties in charge at the municipal level versus the state level. And then there's a lot of overlapping responsibilities where there's too many cooks in the kitchen for one policy area, but then there's no one over here manning the stove, right, for another, and then there's policy vacuum. So this is very prevalent in the water sector. Um, and really affects the ability to get things done. Okay, so um, I want to take a step back. These are some of the political institutional challenges and say that this isn't just about how the water sector, of water and sanitation sector is governed, but I think that the, these really, um, these political and institutional challenges uh, really affect a number of environmental sustainability problems more broadly um, in Mexican cities. And I want to kind of share with you, these are the, the three uh, biggest environmental problems from my perspective. And these governance challenges are, are these are the folks who are kind of overseeing, um, uh, overseeing this. So um, the first is extreme weather events that exacerbate already weak infrastructure and produce um, serious disaster management problems related to flooding, landslides, drought, amongst others. The second is uh, public services and related infrastructure, um, which you know we've been talking about. Um, so this is not just the potable water, but also wastewater. Wastewater is a massive problem. Only about 15% of wastewater receives treatment globally. The numbers in Mexico are 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 very low, and there's also um, a lot of sanitation treatment plants that have been constructed but are not in operation. Um, for some of these reasons, uh, so all of these things are are are, are a major problem. 
Um, and all of this is related to pollution and public health problems where many experience, um, you know, the toxins living and working near these polluted places. So um, these are issues that are really uh, sort of uh, prevalent in Mexican cities and um, are undermined by these govern governance challenges. So this is, you know, to the landfill problem. Um, okay, so just to wrap up, um, will government fulfill their obligations without societal pressure? No. So uh, this is hopefully, you know, we'll start a conversation and we can continue to talk about these things for the next couple of days. Um, but I want to sort of conclude by highlighting some tools that civil society might have to hold city officials accountable for the Mexican water sector and for environmental governance more broadly. Um, so the first is uh, a series of institutional mechanisms. Uh, so these are institutional formal routes such as through litigation, formal petitions and denouncements in institutions such, such as the courts, the ombudsman's office, uh, los tribunales de justicia administrativas, which are, play an important role when people need to make uh, uh, claims against water utilities, for example. And here organized groups play an important role even when they're not immediately successful because it creates a, um, a routine or a pattern of demand making around access to information. That is a really critical thing. I hope we talk about that more. And transparency that future groups can build on. So um, th that's an important one. Another one I want to highlight is um, social accountability research groups. Uh, here, are a number of citizen-led research groups have developed that are focused on social accountability, uh, such as these two that I put here that have really been focused on the water sector, but there's many more. Activists request access to information um, of you know, government documents, research, and they bring to light a lot of government malfeasance. They're playing a really important role. They partner with allies abroad and within Mexico, and they help channel resources to strengthen their accountability-seeking mission. So check them out if you're interested in the water sector. And Controla Tu Gobierno has done a tremendous, tremendous amount of work on trying to identify all the sanitation treatment plants that have been created and how many are in operation and why aren't they in operation and there's just a lot of really great stuff going on. This is all citizen led. And finally, take it to the streets, direct action. Social movements and social protests, marches, rallies, sit-ins are often used sometimes in conjunction with these other tools to advocate and make demands in the water sector. Um, so, you know, I'm working on other projects uh, around organized citizen collective action, and I'm really finding that it's often the only push for upholding environmental regulations and helping to cobble together improved state capacity to deliver public services in these contexts. So, um, citizen-led environmental regulation is really something that is often the regulatory option of, of last resort, but without it, we would really be having, you know, very little movement on any kind of environmental regulations. So, thank you. Thank you, um, Diane and Gabriella, for inviting me to participate in this amazing session. And I can tell that I will be the student here. Um, and I'm really excited to talk in, about ancient Maya self-cleaning reservoirs. Now, I have to set it up first. So I mostly work in the Southern Maya Lowlands, which is um, southeastern Mexico, um, northern Guatemala, and, and Belize, and western Honduras. But it is a, it's a karstic landscape. And so even though it's a jungle, it's, it's, it also is very seasonal. You have the wet and the dry season, but because it's karstic bedrock, it's limestone, much of it percolates through the limestone bedrock. So you don't have as much surface water as you would think in the tropical jungle, um, especially in the interior area. 
um, you know, including um, southeast um, Mexico. You do have bajos, which are seasonal swamps or wetlands, but during the dry season, much of that becomes desiccated. Now, there wasn't one overarching Maya king like you find in many other cultures. There were hundreds of cities, and each had their own ruler or kings, um, depending. Um, and so none of the well-known political powerhouses like Calakmul in Mexico, Tikal in Ranjo in Guatemala, and Caracol in Belize, none of them are located near lakes or rivers or other kinds of permanent surface water. And, and this is significant. And it's during the late classic between 800, 600 and 800 CE where the Maya reached their epitome in terms of power, population size and everything, use of resources and need for water, as well as for agriculture and, and for daily drinking. So what you have are these two worlds. You have five months dry season when the jungle becomes a green desert. Um, the bajos, creeks, aguadas, natural depressions dry up. Rivers and lake levels drop and become murky and disease ridden. And then on the opposite side of the coin, you have tropical storms and you have hurricanes and you know you have this. But the Maya, the ancestral Maya then, thus adapted to two different worlds and they did it quite well. So what you have are these two like mirroring the pulsating system of the tropical world, you have these pulsating systems. So during the rainy season, you have these centrifugal forces because the, um, like other tropical systems around the world, it's very high biodiversity, but it's dispersed. So thus, the soils are dispersed for farming, thus the farmers are dispersed. So you have these dispersed farmsteads during the agricultural intensive period during, during the rainy season. In contrast, during the dry season, you have these centripetal forces um, to, to where people come during the agricultural downtime to cities for, for water, to access to water. There are also markets and public ceremonies, pomp and circumstance, ball games, etc. In other words, there was some degree of seasonal power, which you also find in other um, tropical environments um, in the past um, that's relevant for the present. Now, this is um, Calakmul in Mexico. And it has five major reservoirs. This is a LIDAR map, um, and including the largest known Maya um, ancient reservoir, measuring, you know, quite extensive. And it's likely this one over here. Okay. Um, yes. So let, let's now talk about ancient Maya reservoirs. They really are amazing. This is my thing. <laughs> I just love them. Um, Okay, there's still water systems, and the earliest ones that we know of, some people think they're even earlier, start about 400 BCE. And remember, they've been living here for thousands of years, so they applied their knowledge about living in this environment. And they used wetland reclamation and gravity-fed depression-filling reservoirs that evolved and developed into what they're called elevated stream damming reservoirs. And they stored rainwater and diverted excess water aided by sealants, sluices, dams, et cetera, very sophisticated engineered systems. In fact, cities were water systems. City urban, urbanism, the city grew around the water. So here, for example, you see the Sock Bay. There were no wheels in, um, no wheeled carts because there were no beasts of burden to pull them. So when you see causeways, they were processional. They connected different temple complexes. But this one here also served as dams. So when Inyaki was talking about the single purpose, the Maya had multi-purpose uses for everything. For causeways, they also served as dams. They also served as other purposes as well. In addition, the downslope and the Bajo margin reservoirs also served as gray water. They, they filtered down for fish ponds, for agricultural fields, and for construction purposes, plasters made with a lot of water. So you have all of this. So this is during the dry season, the agricultural downtime, when people came to cities for access to water. But as we know, politicians do nothing for free. So this is so, I mean, the kings didn't build those palaces and temples and ball courts. It was the, the rural farmers who came. To, to attend the markets and to meet um, their friends and potential mates for their children and so on and so on. So you have this pulsating system, this pull, this, this seasonal pull, the seasonal power, the seasonal differences where you had the dry season, you know, pull towards the cities. And then in the, in the rainy season, you had self-organizing sort of independent communities. Okay, but it's that dry season is critical. So these reservoirs, and I said before, let me go back, still water. And because of that, there are issues with water quality that we deal with today, worldwide water quality. Quantity is moot if you don't, if it's not drinkable. 
if it can't support fish, if it can't support plant life kinds of things. So during the dry season in the tropics, it still have high temperatures and you've got high humidity. And together, it can lead to stagnant water, which as you know, waterborne diseases, breeding ground for mosquitoes, build up nitrogen, phosphorus, and promotes algal growth, et cetera, et cetera. So, so my question is, how did Maya, the Maya maintain water quality given that reservoirs and Maya kingship lasted for over a thousand years? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, there were several prolonged droughts that brought the political system to an end. If anything collapsed, it was a political system. There are over 7 million Maya living today. They endured, kings disappeared. Political systems come and go. That's another story. So what they did was, I argue, and I'm, I also currently am working with Oxford on a book. It's um, a general audience book about lessons I've learned from the living Maya, as well as the ancestral Maya. But they apply their traditional ecological knowledge from thousands of years of living in the jungle. They mimicked wetland biospheres to create self-cleaning reservoirs today, which are called constructed wetlands, which are being built as we speak throughout the world. Okay, and so basically a constructed wetland or self-cleaning reservoirs are a mix of macrophytic and hydrophytic plants that live in or near water and other organisms, different kind of bacteria and fish, they all work together to maintain clean water. And you know, for example, biofilms from decomposing plants absorb nitrogen and aquatic plants uptake nitrogen and phosphorus, I mean, all plants do, hence, you know, that's why the fertilizers. Now. So this is the, something I've been studying for, for many years. And not only did the wetland, these constructed wetlands or self-cleaning reservoirs provide clean water, but they also support diverse biota, edible and medicinal plants, um, reeds, bamboo, different kinds of fish, eels, turtles, crabs, shrimp, mollusks. And also the bottom debris would have to be maintained, had to be you know, cleansed and dredged, if you will, but because of all the fish debris and decomposing matter, it also it would serve as an excellent fertilizer. Because ancient Maya cities and all the open spaces, there's evidence, increasing evidence, that they're filled with urban farms and fields and gardens, fish ponds, et cetera, et cetera. So, so to, in dredging the reservoirs, it would have provided fertilizer. And, and also, they would have had to harvest and replenish the aquatic plants. And those, because they uptake nitrogen and phosphorus, they too would also have served as fertilizer. So today, civil engineers especially are exploring um, aspects of constructed wetlands because one of the aspects is greenhouse gases, they admit. But if you control it through dredging and replenishment, and then again, they would serve as fertilizer. So, so this, I think, is a strong argument for the Maya having supported these large cities, some supported up to 100,000 people, um, with these self-cleaning reservoirs in areas without permanent surface water for the five-month dry season, three months of which it does not rain a drop. And that's when I dig, trust me, it don't rain, you know. You're surrounded by all this lush environment, but if you don't know where to find water, you can die of dehydration. It's, it's an amazing, it's an amazing, amazing place. Um, and I will say that, um, that the, um, what you still find today on some reservoir surfaces are water lilies. And they're actually very sensitive plants. They indicate clean water, Nymphaea ampla to be exact. And, and they are associated with Maya rulership. You find headdresses with water lilies. Um, they're referred to as water lily lords. So not only did the kings associate themselves with reservoirs, the palace, the reservoirs are built right next to temple palaces, uh, temple complexes and palaces, but also with clean water. Okay, so that's a, it's sort of an amazing thing. So, so insights for today is, um, you know, appreciating traditional ecological knowledge globally because there's so much to learn. I mean, I've been working in the jungle for over, you know, almost 35 years, and I've had so many scrapes, bites, you name it, and. Uh, most of my foreman and excavation assistants are Maya, and they always find something in the jungle, and I drink whatever they tell me and put whatever, whatever. I do whatever I'm told. And, it, and my, my bites are healed. My fevers are, ah, it's magic. But there's so much knowledge out there, including self-cleaning reservoirs, again, constructed wetlands. Um, 
and the diverse and flexible long-term strategies. Again, these reservoirs lasted for over a thousand years. There's something to be said and there's something to be learned. Um, and it would also, building more, you know, more biomimicry, not just constructed wetlands, but you know, medicinal kinds of things, agricultural practices, the Maya farm sustainably for 5,000 years without deforesting um, to the extent we're seeing presently. Um, but it also would fulfill the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number six to ensure access to clean water for everyone, as well as to encourage the participation of local communities, because it can be at the ground level up. Okay. And, and constructed wetlands. And let me just leave something to ponder. Um, did you realize, did you know there are over 10 million swimming pools in the United States alone? My idea is to transform some of those, voluntarily of course, into constructed wetlands because you can have all this edible plants and all these fish and turtles, et cetera, et cetera. You could drink the water and you could still swim. Just an idea. Um, so, and I think I'm within the 15 minutes, so thank you. Twenty-five minutes left for this. Part. We have got to be out of here by I think by seven forty-five or so. Uh, I want to thank all our presenters. Um, first of all, I just want to say that there are so many amazing comments and insights that we're going to pursue tomorrow. Knowing most of the panels and some of these questions about the law and politics and ecology and saving water, etc. So. Um, what we just want to do is maybe start a little conversation up here today. I have one, I'm sitting here on the front row thinking, what question can I ask that would possibly unify these three different presentations? But I, I do have one question that I want to ask each of you, and then maybe if you want to ask each other a question or pick up on some of each other's points, and then we'll open it out to the audience. But I guess I wanted to start with... Um, I guess I want us to think, and again, I'm in a planning program, although I'm a social scientist, I do historical work. So I'm really interested in what are we going to do for our future, not just like what are the problems that we have that put us in, in this disaster. Obviously, Inaki, you are a landscape architect. I forgot to mention you got your PhD. You studied and got your PhD at Penn. I think I stopped it. Yeah, no, not really. Well, no, you were at Penn. Not a PhD. Yeah, no. and you taught at the GSD. I didn't get through all the... All the um, the bio, but um, the normative question, I've seen like there's a little bit of a normative question that you guys are all answering. We're, Veronica's interested in citizen mobilization. In other words, what should we do to kind of make, to deal with these problems? How can we find a, a more positive pathway? You mentioned citizen mobilization. Inyaki, you've designed a beautiful park that has some of these elements, the health, the beauty and the health that will be accessible. So that's kind of, you have a normative project. And Lisa, you have some great ideas, not only the swimming pool, but also the way we learn from traditional knowledge. But the question that I want to add on top of that is I'm, I couldn't help but think that the ghost of Bruno Latour <laughs> over, over this panel, and thinking a little bit about the visions, visions of the future Bruno would ask us to frame it in terms of whether we're embracing modernization or modernity. What is the vision, the larger kind of society that we're imagining within which these normative strategies would work? And the, the reason that I'm asking you about that, so what's your vision for where we're heading as, a, as societies and as a civilization? Um, and the reason I, I'm asking that question is because I was very compelled and taken, Lisa, by your sharing with us the fact that there is not a stable or fixed regime of, of the Mayan, but it varies. There are two modalities that vary. So it's not, it's, there's an ephemerality to even how they organize themselves based on the kind of shifting ecology in time. That seems to me like an, 
uh, invitation to think about Latour, like what is the kind of, how do we imagine our societal future in a world of this ecological precarity or where things are shifting, maybe not in the, in the kind of balancing you mentioned the Maya from you know, two different systems in a single year, but we're moving to new systems because the ecology is changing in part because of the, the, the actions of all of us. So rather than thinking about a modernist vision, what is the vision for the Anthropocene that we, would, that we are thinking about when we suggest some normative actions? So if, does anybody want to pick, pick that up, that small little question? <laughs> All right, I'll say so. I'm looking at you, Veronica. <laughs> Why not? Let's, I'll open my mouth, see what happens. Uh, so I would say that, um, you know, so much of what was talked about today uh, gets me to thinking about um, just the need for flexibility, right? The need for adaptability um, and all the things that we're talking about. So I think that that is, uh, even just to go back to, for example, uh, the wastewater question, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, so much money and effort has been spent on creating these large, massive construction, large treatment plants, mm -hmm. right? And there's all these different problems with them. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about, you know, wastewater treatment at the apart department, uh, apartment level, right? Or just decentralize something that can move mm -hmm. and shift with, um, you know, with with our environment and with um, more sort of um, adapting to 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 the year, adapting to the weather, adapting um, to the present, and mm -hmm. and I I think that and there's so many other examples. Everybody could give examples of that, but I but I I, I want to just emphasize that in order to have greater flexibility in design, um, what we need is more access to information. I think that the right to information. Mm -hmm of citizens for all of this is really what can help create more flexibility because so many of the things that we're talking about um, is, is, is shrouded in secrecy. You know, people don't have access to information mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what's going on, how all the funds are being spent, mm -hmm. and who is getting to make decisions, and who is being held accountable for those decisions. So I think the right to information is really a cr critical part of greater uh, climate flexibility and adaptability, and especially critical to, uh, you know, getting the water sector to be something that you know we will have water in 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the right to information, I think, would be something I would underscore. Great, uh, and I would just say that just to kind of that's I love the answer because in a way you're saying that the. Okay, if we think that mo modernity or the modernist vision was about f big yeah, fixed that's infrastructure, that's what we thought it was was for a while. Right, right. That we are moving into an era, and even the critique of Fordism and post-Fordism yeah. into flexible specialization. Yeah. So we're at a moment, but it's not just about how capitalism works or industrial. It's how the ecology is working that we have to be more ephemeral in our plans for action. Lisa or Inyaki, I want to hear from both of you. Who wants to, does anybody else want to jump in on this? I can try. <laughs> it's, a, it's an easy one. Okay, it, all right. No, 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 not at all. I think you're asking a very, very, very complex question, not only even to think about it. Um, I, I think, and I don't mean to sound corny with this, but I think we, we need more love and more synchronicity because we need to understand that we are in this planet and that there are certain things that we're going to have to share. And that this question that we talked about in Mexico a long time ago, who, you know, who water belongs to, mm -hmm. I think it's the most relevant question that is there today. And infrastructure and everything has to do with that. The problem is that economic systems, and we go back to this, you know, it's greed at the end of it. It's, uh, it's not going to change. It's not going to allow it to change unless until these things become you know, something they can profit from. And um, I, I don't know, that's why I found maybe so fascinating this idea about the pools, in, you know, in the, because they can, they can still be pools, but they can be something else, you know, and you can, we can take advantage of that. But also, I think that has to happen to infrastructure. I mean, these treatment plans that don't work, 
I think that the, I, probably you have this information much better than me, but I understand it's like 90% in Mexico or something yeah. like this. This has to do basically with construction businesses, you know, mm. contractors, with what? With what? construction, construction businesses. businesses. Uh, the, the contractor companies that carry these mm -hmm. are the same ones that, uh, that build highways. They are, you know, it has to do with also, of course, with its server, this, some of these problems that you pointed out. I just want to have a whole conference about wastewater. <laughs> like next just, year yeah. but the, but I, but I, I, yeah. I see one one thing that we have yeah. and, and that's why I also th mean a little bit more synchronicity of, uh, because since I worked in the government because I never did it before I worked you know doing projects for the government and stuff I realize now that this cry that we have a citizen is normal and it's, uh, I think is the right way to go about accountability uh, it's very it's very difficult as a public servant without transparency because you are risking a lot mm -hmm. if you try to innovate. Mm -hmm. you know? And we need to innovate. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's, everything is against anyone who wants to innovate because they will be held responsible for anything that goes wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's you know, it's, there's really a conflict. And mm -hmm. I think that people will, will simply not go the direction we need to go in policy, mm -hmm. in operation, in you know, in how to change the things, mm -hmm. how to change the things we do, because there's a there's a big big, yeah. big risk in doing it. Big risk if you're risking money and you're in business. Big risk if you're in government and you're, you know, a public servant. Mm -hmm. Big risk, you know, for governments if you want to get reelected, etc. So. I don't know. I mean, I'm just posing what, what you know what it brings, but I don't know exactly how to go around that. Yeah, that's great. And I know I'm just going to say that I'm sure we're going to continue this conversation tomorrow on several of the panels. I might just add because I'm thinking, you know, on our panel, um, that there's also a risk for citizens. Of course. Because water access has been killed in Mexico, yeah, that's, so uh, yes, everybody yes, is yes, facing the risk. Yes. But like, we are still trying to move forward. Right. Lisa, you'll have, why don't you, we'll hear from you and then we'll open it out to questions. Um, well, I have a totally different approach to things because, again, of what I've learned from the Maya, from various um, aspects of them. And it's a total different mind uh, frame, frame of mind. And because, you know, we're living in what we now call the Anthropocene. And that has been caused by our anthropocentric way, our worldview. And they have an inclusive worldview where everything has a role in maintaining the world and, and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it led to thousands of years, millennia, not just the Maya, of sustainable living. And our anthropocentric worldview has led to the Anthropocene, which is not something to brag about. So um, what I'm trying to get is to get people thinking and to reevaluate where we are and to, because one of the things I, 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 I've said before is that we rely on the resources of this earth, the plants and everything. We rely on the earth. We cannot survive without it. Yet all of our strategies and plans privilege humans. And unless we get out of that mind frame and privilege non-humans as well, because you know we need the earth, the earth doesn't need us. You know, just something to end with. <laughs> that's Latour, that that's what I said. So let's start at, let, please, we'll have some questions. Please introduce yourself, stand, stand up, I mean, uh, yeah, Pau has a, has a, yeah. Introduce yourself and. I'm um, CJ Alvarez. Um, so I just, that's a perfect segue to, to my question. Um, Lisa, I wanted to ask you what water meant to the Maya. And, and so I, and I think that just it's a little bit of, kind of tagging along with, with the, you know, with, with what you all were talking about, something tells me it wasn't two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom, um, an H2O. And so I think that there's, I, I suspect that there is a connection between thinking about water as just three atoms and the sustainability problems that we have. It's just a resource that needs to be shared, but but if, if we're thinking about it strictly as just this thing that we can use for, for our purposes, that mentality itself is like embedded in the sustainability problem itself. So could you speak to the, the broader meaning, not just the harnessing and the capture and the multi-use aspect, but like the philosophical, cosmological 
meaning of water in the society that you study? Um, sure. Water is life. Water is death. Water is everything. I mean, there's watery aspects of the underworld. Um, there, it's rainfall dependent because of the, the various reasons. Most rivers are entrenched, so they don't have massive irrigation systems. It's completely rainfall dependent. So the rain gods, the ancestors, are critical to bringing all of this to fruition. The waters, and if you overuse it, if you do this, if you do that, your ancestors will get you, the gods will get you. So it's this balance. So you don't overuse. It's just so much part of their life. And speaking of life, remember, humans are what? 67% of water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we reach a point when there's so many people that we, and their water is finite, that we will start, I don't know, absorbing too much water? Just a question. But um, no, water was just so much part of their, their, their cosmology. Everything was fluid. Everything flowed. You know, so the pulsating system. You know, everything. You know, fl it flowed like a stream. Even the still water underneath, there was life. Mm -hmm. So every, there's so many aspects. They have different terms for water. You know, steel, lake, ocean. So many. You know, we have water. You know, we should have more terms, to because it is so it is so important, and it should be more important than just H two O and defining it as water. We need to give it more respect. Inyaki, go and then we'll ask him. Uh, very quickly, I just want to pick on that because it also helps me talk about something Veronica mentioned, which is information. I think that we do need much more information, but not in the form of the, necessarily on, all in the form of rational you know, information, you know, that we read and that we simply listen to, but actually information that really feels and changes the way we feel. In the case of Mexico City, for example, Mexico City Valley, just connect, reconnecting to the rain season, dry season for most urban inhabitants, except those who, who, who are you know, uh, hurting because of the floodings, it would be incredibly important to reconnect to another broader, more profound meaning of what water and the la our landscape and our, uh, eventually our earth means, I think. Mm -hmm. So it definitely is about information, but not necessarily you know, the kind of information we're pr pursuing here, but maybe the kind of information that Lisa was talking about. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because of the oh, the recording, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Paola. Um, thank you to the three of you for your excellent presentations. I really enjoy it, and so many things came to my mind because, well, I, I'm come from uh, I come from Sonora in northwest Mexico, so I have questions for the three of you, but I don't want to impose <laughs> on the use of the mic. So I will go uh, with a question for Lisa. Um, in the Sonoran Desert, we also have a bimodal uh, type of climate. And you can see it's so obvious that it's all death during most of the year, and then the, the monsoon comes, the North American monsoon, and then you see this lush desert. It's, it's beautiful. It's full of flowers. Everything is moving in the cycle. And I like very much your idea about what we can learn from the past cultures that were there before we, we build our cities and everything. And I, I am actually um, waiting for a proposal that I submitted to know these kinds of things. What, what things did the people in the Sonoran Desert in the past that could be informative for adaptation towards the future? I, I think that is a, a, a very valuable idea. But my question is about the scale. And I know this comes every time that we talk about traditional strategies. Um, the, the amount of people that is already in the world and the type of economy that we have and all these water and land rights already in place, how do, do they play for us to facilitate that we can use these types of resources in those specific traditional ways? Um, and maybe another way to do the question is, how many of these strategies that you have seen in the past are still be being practiced by people that is living there, like current uh, people, people from today, the actual, the actual people that is living there. 
And if you think it is possible given current conditions and not the Mayan conditions like a couple centuries ago. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Well, um, a lot of the, I do see a lot of traditional things, especially agriculture, um, you know, since the, the last 500 years with the Spanish colonial, you know, um, invasion and the conquest, or there's been a lot of things, and now, you know, water is piped and, you know, the villages are becoming more westernized to show how successful they are, and ironically giving up some of that information. So agriculture is the best thing I know. But archaeologists still rely on these ancient Maya reservoirs that haven't been maintained for over a thousand years. I mean, to do construction, consolidation kinds of things. But, but in terms of some of the, the, the how-to, I mean, you don't need government approval to change your, your swimming pool into a constructed wetland or self cleaning reservoir. And there are already companies who are creating natural pools. I mean, they're doing it just for swimming, but I think they can take it to the next level and make it more functional in terms of other uses of water kinds of things. So I think it has to be from the bottom up. Although, and not necessarily social action, per se. But if there was a, like, like the lawn removal program, you know, where that would be help to incentivize it. Like, if there was a sort of, I feel like people need to be paid in order to do it. That's an, I mean, I understand I mean, that. Cynical, That's, it's, it's unfortunate that people aren't thinking about, I mean, people say they love their kids. Well, prove it. <laughs> well, you know, well, that's a, another comment. Yeah, that's, that's another. the third year. Well, but just people are, you know, our, our yeah, ideas, yeah. our strategies, even some of the sustainable strategies and climate change kinds of things are, are you know, they sound good, but they're short term. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I mean, think of solar panels, no offense, yeah. and, and, and electric cars. All of them are made with finite resources. And um, the University of Illinois just got funding from um, $120 million from the Africa Department of Energy because they're looking into bioenergy, using plant to create energy, plant life, instead of these finite resources. So I think it's going to be, we're still thinking in a box. We need to step outside that box. And, and, and when you have people from the higher ups, so like the, when the climate change, what was it, 196 nations voted for it? You know, that's moot unless it's us who support them doing that and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Um, I, I, while we're, Amara, you have one? Um, what, we, what Just before you start, I just want to just pick up on that a little bit. Again, we'll come back to this tomorrow, but um, I, I think I'm, so we can respond to the kind of local knowledge and history and there, there are techniques out there, but I, I would like to keep on the table the question of scale that America asked. As all, and I, to me, that's related to my question about the societal configuration. At what, are we thinking about like clusterings of small communities, these ephemera small communities? It could start there. That's the scale. One could start there, but that's the question of the scale that butts up against the modernist scale in a nation with a nationalist approach like Mexico. So these are the questions we talk about. We might think where we want to end. How do you get there? What is the political, social conflict that allows you? But you need to have an idea of where you want, where you're heading, scale-wise and vision-wise. Mario, please. Sorry. Gracias. Eh, muy interesante los trabajos que se están planteando. ¿Sí entienden español la mayoría? Me dijeron. Sí. sí. Eh, mi pregunta básicamente es, este, ¿cuál es la posición de ustedes o de sus proyectos, de sus trabajos, en cuanto a los grandes megaproyectos que justamente están pegando en, en los lugares donde ustedes están trabajando? Principalmente en la Ciudad de México, eh, con la política pública, eh, la ley de aguas nacionales que se, que se han estado implementando, en donde despojan a las comunidades del, del control del, del uso del destino del agua para dárselo o formar este, posibilidades de crear entes generalizados como población o como, o como este, conceptos muy vagos pues, ¿no? que se pueden utilizar para diferentes formas, eh, principalmente para la iniciativa privada. 
Eh, y por otro lado, pues los aeropuertos, ¿verdad? Que justamente se están proyectando en las áreas de Texcoco y el, y el saqueo de agua indiscriminado en Xochimilco. Eh, o sea, un poco van en contra de los trabajos que, que, que efectivamente se están realizando exitosamente, ¿no? Eh, y pues como bien lo comentaban ahorita, lo impor la importancia del manejo del agua, del, de, de guardar el agua que tenían como concepto los pueblos mayas, y creo que todos los pueblos indígenas conocen un poco de esto, pero también ahora el Tren Maya, ¿verdad? que viene este, pegándole duro a todos los cenotes, a, a los ríos subterráneos, porque el problema de, 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 de la península es justo que no hay ríos este, que corren superficialmente, sino que el agua corre por, por debajo, por eso la agricultura no se puede dar, por eso la gran protesta que hubo cuando se implementaron grandes miles de hectáreas para sembrar soya transgénica, ¿verdad? y que el glifosato se venía directo a, a los cenotes, a los ríos subterráneos, de los cuales las ciudades tomaban agua, incluyendo los turistas. Pues, ¿no? Entonces, ¿cómo confrontar o cómo armonizar todos estos trabajos que se están haciendo con esta política pública que se está llevando en México, contrario a todo lo que se está manifestando. Pues, ¿no? Creo que es muy general, pero es importante también saber su opinión. Understand Spanish, maybe not everybody, yeah, but. Okay, yeah. Yeah, do you want, or we could give us some. Yeah. Uh, so the question was what is your position on mega projects? And one of the examples he was saying was like the law of nation, uh, national water that disposes the people of the destiny of water use. And another one was like the airports, and the third one was the mine train that destroys a lot of crops. Which is another version of the question about scale and modernity. But why don't we let everybody respond to this? And then we'll have to end because we have to leave this room for a certain amount of time. And But we will continue the conversation tomorrow. And we will hear from many of you in your panel. So Iñaki, do you want to okay. take a stab? Um. Yeah, so, so my comments here are, have to do with the information that I have. So not all of them, not all of it is going to be uh, super informed. Uh, from what I understand and from what I've seen in the, in the Konawa, is a lot of what is being done is trying to bring water to a lot of communities, like the cities who have been actually uh, neglected in many ways. You know? In the case of uh, Our project in in Texcoco, we're actually working with the communities. We're working with the Frente de Pueblos en Defensa de la Tierra, for long, who have been fighting and defending this area for a long time since since 1981, at least, when the first version of the airport was uh, attempted there. Um, I think that there is no absolute correct answer to that because I think. Each case has to be looked upon because, as I said, just like we need to uh, make uh, agriculture more efficient in many ways, because, for example, Usar, uh, to continue to use flooding for agriculture, I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily the best way to go. Also, uh, I mean, uh, we need to technify that in order to make it more efficient, in order to be able to recover, for example, landscape, which might seem as something which is not as urgent as producing food, but it's maybe as important, you know, for the future. So how do you balance that is not an easy question. And it, it, I think it would have to be analyzed case by case. What I think is ridiculous is, for example, that we brag upon, you know, sending avocados, uh, tomatoes, nuts, and berries to the U.S., you know, what, what no? basically means we're exporting water, you know, virtual water. So I think that has to be looked upon much, much more carefully. I was talking to some people the other day, and I think that, uh, about Mexico, but I think it's, this should be worldwide, that you know, 
coming back to your question, that we need a map of uh, potentialities, of real potentialities. I mean, there is, for example, mining, which is completely symbolic, like gold. And for me, it doesn't make any sense to mine gold. It's just, you know, plain stupid, especially when you're destroying the, the, the jungle in Chiapas. But there are certain areas where you can have mining for certain materials that we need and that, that, that might be, you know, not as high impact in terms of the impact that it creates. So we would have to actually be much more intelligent on what, what to do in certain areas. I think that the mega condition is inescapable in the next 100 years. And this, this is something that, you know, I realized maybe 25 years ago, and it is happening, and it's not going to, you know, it's not going to go down until maybe 20, 2080. So we have to either, you know, just, and I, and I, and, and I deny this position, but uh, I think we have to find a better way to do, to make the, the mega condition work. And that means having certain infrastructure, you know, a certain size of infrastructure, and we have to make it work. We, it's, we depend on that. And uh, as, uh, because the, the, it's not going to go away mm -hmm. just because we want to. Water is part of that. Airports are part of that. And, you know, dealing, you know, like I said, infrastructure, for example, sewage. Mm -hmm. And there's intelligent people thinking about this problem, like Bill Gates with the, mm -hmm. his competitions about the, the, the decentralizing, let, let uh, decentralizing, <laughs> the, decentralizing the, 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 you know, toilets, etc. Because then you don't rely on, on centralized infrastructure potentially. And that could mean that you liberate uh, a lot of uh, a lot of infrastructure from inhabitation from the city grids, and the amount of money that you need to invest in order to make them to make them operational, it's uh, yeah, it could go yeah. brutally down. Yeah, well, I think well, you'll get a, mi a minute not to try to respond just quickly, quick. quickly. and I just want to remind everybody that I, when I introduced this panel, I said there were going to be disagreements and there's going to be provocations. Well, I, I, I just yeah. want to say, no, I just want to say, I mean, I could go on about this forever, but um, that socio-environmental conflicts are the largest conflicts there are in many countries. Peru, uh, from mining to uh, hydro dams to many of the projects that you just mentioned. Uh, absolutely, when you are studying social movements or social mobilization, it is absolutely the case that siting around these projects and all of the uh, negative environmental impacts and community impacts, relocation, water pollution, landfill, I mean, it is just where conflicts are occurring. And so I think a lot of times people talk about water wars and things like that. It has to do, like, these are not trivial questions. These are absolutely things that need to be addressed. And, and I will also say that if communities don't mobilize in the ways that they're mobilizing, they don't get anything. So it is critical. And there are environmental, there are entire companies that exist in Latin America that you can hire if you're a government official to take the environmental impact assessment that you're supposed to do that's and and they don't have to do it. They, you get a consultant and you and they come in and they basically uh, you know go through all these loopholes and they don't actually have the community con consultation. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of money being put into skirting these requirements for environmental impact assessments and community uh, participation in those projects. So this is I think it's just such an important question and such an important part of understanding, you know water and water threats. So I, I really appreciate this question and you know I think we should continue to talk about it. We will it. continue tomorrow. Lisa, you the last comment. Well I mean the only project I'm familiar with is the train going through and the damage it's doing and, and the lack of the uh, companies and governments not listening to local communities, um, hydrologists, archaeologists, um, forest personnel, um, and just making a choice to for profit, which I mean, I realize that is you know profit matters, but at the expense, it's again, it's one of those short term things, and I think it's it is it's in the short term, it's going to damage the water that has it's going to have long term implications, and um, I don't know what people can do about it though. We'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>
Yay. So can you give a round of applause to this great panel?